climate change. Uh, so thank you very much, both of you, for taking the time to be with us. And Ravish, can I hand over to you? Thank you. Climate change cannot be solved by India. Before that, let me say it's going to affect India. Let's have no doubt about it because the way things are going, we can expect a rise in temperature, a fall in agricultural productivity, flooding of our low lying areas, uh, definitely a, a, a change in the monsoon pattern, bulk, a, a change in the distribution of rainfall, which could actually mean long periods of drought long periods of excessively heavy rains, all of which will impose a lot of difficulty. And the sad thing is that there's nothing we can do by ourselves that will change this. This will only change if there is a global response to tackle climate change. And that's happening in some kind of global format where we are also involved. Now, for a long time, the debate in India was, it's their fault, they should do it, why should we do it, etc. That train has left the station because we now, the Prime Minister has committed that we will get to net zero by 2070. Many people may think, will we be able to do that? But that, that's a commitment. And in fact, what they were saying is that we should commit 2050. And quite rightly, we have said, look, you guys should get there by 2040. We will get there a little later. Indonesia has said 2060. We have said 2070. I'm going to take that as fixed. This should be, it should be the national objective now. How do we get there by 2070? Now, those who feel that this is the wrong objective, we should have a separate seminar on that. I'm not going to address that issue at all. So what does it actually mean? I think the first thing we have to realize is that the world is not in good shape to achieve the targets that is claimed it will achieve. So let me just go through these slides a little bit. Um, you know, this is, this is a new website of the Global State of Climate Action, which is run by the Bezos Fund and a couple of others. And what they do is they track what's happening. So they're actually tracking something like 14 areas. And within them, they have about 31 indicators. So they're going to track each of these for each major country. And based on that tracking, we will get a sense of how is the world doing. And I just want to summarize what the most recent uh, presentation on this website is. That first, there is only one indicator on which the world is on track. That indicator is private sector companies being transparent in how much CO2 they're going to be generating. That's the only one where the international judgment is, you wanted to tell the story, of what is India doing? The thing to do would be to ask, what are you doing in the power sector? Because power is 50% of the CO2 emissions in the country. And it's very clear what you have to do. You have to shift from coal and gas-based generation to renewable energy. Now, fortunately, the technology exists to do that. There are problems, we'll come to that later. But one is power. Second is transport where instead of using fossil fuels directly uh, to give energy to the vehicle, you switch to electric vehicles. Of course, this has to be combined with the electricity becoming uh, renewable. There's no use having electric vehicles if the electricity generated to, to charge the batteries is all generated from coal. But I'm assuming these two things go together. The third is industry, where you have a lot of what we have to do. Now this is, this is just to give you a sense of how much is needed. This chart is taken from a, a paper produced in Irabe, Jyoti Parikh and others, I mean, they're all there at the bottom. And this, is a, this optimizes a way of reducing emissions to get to net zero either by 2050 or by 2060, or what's gonna happen on a, this 
business as usual basis. So the purpose of this chart is to show you how much we have to go. The brown line on top is business as usual. Uh, whatever progress there is, it will keep on happening. Slowly, renewable energy capacity will also increase, and the uh, uh, carbon will shoot up and then come down, but not get to zero. The blue is what you need. The model is telling you how to get there. So technically, what the model is saying is that technology exists to do it, but we have to see how difficult that is. But even that will require carbon dioxide to increase a little bit, down a little bit, a fair bit, and then come down. And then you have, if you want to make the net zero by 2050, even then there'll be some increase, but very quickly coming down. So I think the reason I'm mentioning this is that, you know, too much of our, when we discuss, is everything happening? People say, oh, we're building renewable energy capacity. You will build renewable energy even in the business as usual. Uh, I think this is just to tell you what are the areas which we have to pick up. Every one of these areas can become a source of intense controversy. Number one, if you're going to do that much increase in renewable energy, then the system must be able to finance the creation of renewable energy capacity. Renewable energy, by the way, is more upfront capital intensive than simply coal. So the upfront need for investment will be much greater. Later on, we'll have benefits, but in the short run, you have a bigger burden. Second, if you go to renewable energy, then the power is not a steady stream. And frankly, if you're right, more expensive because the cost of storage has to be added. And you know, the present position is that if you could use renewable energy when it's produced, it's actually cheaper than coal. Uh, use of markets, so where there's a surplus, they can trade it with others, and it's not clear that our electricity markets are flexible enough to do that. Where very often we take the coal from somewhere and put the plant where the electricity is needed, here, the electricity can only be generated in certain areas and it will be have to take it to the rest of the country by setting up a transmission capacity. That will involve prices. You know, if, if energy is more plentifully available at one part, part of the day and becomes scarce in another, then the logical thing is the price of electricity should vary. It should be high when electricity is scarce, low when it's in surplus. I don't think we have systems that yet can do that, and quickly you phase out with open question. But without doubt, you look at the possibilities, we ought to be planning on a phasing out, a phasing down of coal for power sometime towards the middle or later part of the next decade. This also means that coal production targets have to be adjusted downwards. <coughs> Namaskar to everybody. Uh, I used to consider uh, people like Dr. Ranguwalia, Dr. Mohan as Spirit experts, legendary figures in this development economics area. So when I was invited to share uh, the task with them, I was a little taken aback, surprised. I thought, what could, but the other is bureaucrats. My apologies to any bureaucrats sitting here. Both of us can be heading ministries, globalization today, go back us tomorrow. <laughs> All that is required is one transfer. And we are considered experts in both areas. So probably they thought that, you know, as a politician, he can talk about everything and anything, whether he knows or doesn't know. But let us see what the political or social people have to say on this. But when the next question is why I decided to come, that's more important for me. I committed to this climate agenda as pro probably Dr. Uh, Mohan or uh, Dr. Ahluwalia, all of you are. I consider it as a very, very important agenda for the country, for the people, and for the whole world, as it is rightly pointed out. It cannot be the agenda for any one nation or one community or one, one, one region. It has to be a global agenda. Now, that is about the most important issue. Firstly, I mentioned it in an informal conversation earlier also. See, this whole climate discourse, he is stuck for common man, it is a subject uh, which he cannot relate with. 
the other side is very romantic in the sense that if I plant a few trees, uh, the uh, challenge is addressed. Or if I say Mata Prithvi Putra Prithviya is our ancient wisdom, the problem is addressed. Both are important. The ancient wisdom of this country when it, uh, with respect to uh, you know, India's uh, uh, birth, climate, this whole creation, this earth and all that, is an important guide, important pointer to us uh, as to how we should handle it. I remember at the Rio de Janeiro first Earth Summit in 1980, when Madam Indira Gandhi as Prime Minister went to speak, uh, I think she was the only Prime Minister there, right? Uh, other countries, famous shloka, Mata, Prutsvihi, Putra, Prutsvihya. This is how we look at uh, the whole question of climate. We revere climate. We, we revere nature. We revere, uh, you know, all the aspects of nature. Uh, so, uh, on that question of underdevelopment, we won elections. <laughs> Having won elections on this question, we go to Global Forum and say, you know, you can't blame us because we were underdeveloped. We did not pollute. That is the old mindset. We, India, needs to give it up. So, uh, while in, 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 uh, in our, in our uh, eagerness, or in our comfortable consumption, as in that, public transport, trains, how, we still have not achieved 100% electrification. We still use diesel engines in large parts of our railways. So sectorally, we need to now government needs needs to realize that government is the challenge 